All right, cool. Um, yeah, so uh, the recording is usually posted um, on a website that I run. Um, the links can be sent out to you via email and, and you're free to peruse um, the earlier content where I do do a lot more explaining uh, of the basics here. But in, in particular, um, today I wanted to look at something called the uh, quantum Fourier transform. Let me go ahead and um, share my screen here. And uh, let's see if I can, okay, cool. And I have, I have chat here as well. Um, if you have any questions, you know, I'm monitoring chat at the moment, you know, anything doesn't look clear, please don't hesitate to use that chat function. I mean, you were primarily um, an education oriented organization. So um, if I am unable to explain something to you, that means that something on my end has to be improved. So that being said, I'm going to go ahead and uh, try and explain what this, uh, what this quantum Fourier transform is. And the way I'm going to do it, I'm just going to give like a, a brief overview here, is it's actually two different things that, that come together very nicely. And it is the fundamental building block for um, a lot of algorithms here, uh, a lot of quantum computing algorithms. Like once you know QFT, um, it opens up a lot of avenues um, to understanding content. So um, here's the sort of quantum Fourier transform. Everyone just likes to call it um, QFT. And it's used in, in certain properties such as uh, quantum phase estimation and uh, Shor's algorithm or discrete logarithms. Uh, just to, I, I know I'm spooning on this technical nonsense. Um, how many of you guys, uh, you know, like you can unmute yourselves, like, like how many of you guys know what a, a qubit is or, or superposition? I'm just curious, like what the level of um, technical uh, expertise is here so I can kind of gauge which direction I'm going to go with this particular workshop. Um, in my physics courses. Oh, wow, excellent. Okay, so do have, uh, oh, wow, okay, nice. So I'm assuming a lot of people here already know um, what a qubit is. Okay, perfect, that's cool. Then you guys will know um, the, what you know QFT is really useful for. Uh, so quantum phase estimation um, is this property here. Uh, you've probably seen this a million times already, but it never hurts to um, see it again. And it is the idea that we can have this algorithm that will tell us what this, um, what this theta is here. So given that U is some unitary matrix and unitary matrix is kind of uh, in quantum computing parlance is just a nice way of saying, okay, if I have some gate or some series of operations that I'm doing, uh, what exactly might the eigenvalue um, or the eigenvector be um, for this particular unitary matrix? So um, quantum Fourier transform is a huge part of this. And Quantum phase uh, estimation, um, QPE, is even, it's even, even larger component um, for many other algorithms as well. Even for solving um, systems of linear equations, you can do that with uh, your quantum computers as well. And uh, Shor's algorithm. And Shor's algorithm is kind of the poster child of quantum computing. Uh, everybody, uh, when you mention Shor's algorithm, um, it's embedded in science fiction. And, um, and the basic idea behind Shor's, if I were to introduce it to you in the most colloquial way possible, is if I give you some random number, like 14, and I, I ask you, find the sort of prime factors for it, a Shor's algorithm can do it. And the reason why you know, Shor's or any of this quantum computing nonsense is, is super cool is because we do have methods uh, for you know, my MacBook or for your cell phone to figure out um, what these prime factors are uh, pretty trivially. But... Um, the problem is once these numbers get uh, much larger, like if I give you a 17 or a 100 digit uh, number, it becomes very sort of computationally prohibitive to do. Um, it, takes in, it takes an exponential amount of time. But Chor's algorithm promises sort of sub-exponential times, um, which is particularly tantalizing uh, and disconcerting, um, considering that most of all modern day cryptography relies on the fact that finding these factors are, are notoriously difficult. Um, to do. Although confirmation of these factors is pretty easy because if, if you have several, um, you know, n times m, I just do multiplication and I can confirm that this is the right number. So that is, um, that is what the quantum Fourier transform uh, is part of. And the high level overview is that all that the uh, QFT does is it gives you a change of basis. So what do I mean by um, a change of basis? Normally, uh, when you open Qiskit, you open um, Google CERC, you open any of your uh, beloved quantum computing frameworks, they start you off in uh, the computational basis um, or the X basis, where your state vector representing your qubit is either you know, pointing up or is pointing vertically up or, or vertically down. And you can imagine this is um, the block sphere here. And before I go any further, 
usually most of the meetings are not just me kind of um, talking and, and doodling stuff. I will usually have a Jupyter notebook or some interactive component for you guys to play around with. And I, and I encourage you guys um, with that kind of stuff to uh, break things. Like I, I design those notebooks so you can break them uh, because you know one of the good things about being a, a software engineer or even a physicist is you look at conditions in the extreme. That's where you start to familiarize yourself with how things work and um, their unique properties. But um, for this, this particular, just for today, just for today, um, it, it'll be a lot more um, explanation related. And I, I am monitor, monitoring chat. So once again, any questions, I am more than willing to pause and sort of explain it. So basically, all of these computations tend to start in this computational basis. And if I apply the quantum Fourier transform, so if I were to take the um, QFT, and uh, uh, apologies for my uh, terrible handwriting, I'm, I'm using my mouse here. Um, on the state vector. So this is just representing a singular qubit. Um, it brings me to uh, another basis. Um, so all I'm, all I'm really doing here is instead of zero and one being the orthogonal vectors that are my basis for this qubit, um, I'm now on the sort of, uh, it's, not the, it's not the Hadamard, it's the Z basis. There we go, um, if I'm correct here. So this would just be, uh, you're sort of sitting now on the circumference of your block sphere uh, instead of your uh, north and south pole. And this, you know, if, if I were to, the reason why I did my explanation backwards, like here are the applications and then here is what it actually does is because this is sort of, um, you know, it's, it's nice to have this backdrop of knowing that yes, it's worth understanding um, every part of this. Um, and then like, here's kind of like the, the sort of overarching idea. And now we can actually get um, into the uh, technical aspect. So before I you know, decide to go ahead and, and get to the quantum computing part, we have to remember um, that I mentioned in the very beginning that this is two different things that have been uh, elegantly combined together. There's some part that sits in the quantum computing realm and there's a large chunk of it that sits in, in sort of our, our classical realm um, that uh, you know, our computers and even Zoom, Zoom right now is doing some form uh, of a Fourier transform uh, just so you guys can hear um, my voice, whether or not you like it or not. But. <laughs> So the idea behind, we have to start with this idea of the Fourier transform. I'm just gonna abbreviate it um, FT. And the idea behind a Fourier transform is that I can, uh, you know, just as this quantum Fourier transform lets me switch between these different bases, um, I can do a similar thing with, in terms of uh, real world data. And, and the classical example that's given is let's say that here's, you know, here's my voice, you know, it's uh, Here's the amplitude, and then it's uh, over time. So as time progresses, my the amplitude changes, and and um, this is some sort of uh, signal. Um, but what happens is maybe there's uh, you know maybe I have uh, something going on in the background. There's some unwanted noise, and I'd like to get rid of it. Uh, in which case, it, this is pretty difficult to work with. Uh, uh, you know, it, it's kind of hard to come up with math that will work on the raw signal. So what we do is we apply this transform, and I get something that looks like this. So now I'm no longer in this time domain, as we call it, I'm in the sort of frequency domain here. So this now becomes Hertz, and this is still, this is still amplitude, but now the chart looks something like this. So maybe the sort of lower frequencies of my voice might be at, um, I'm just making a number up here, um, 61 Hertz. And then, you know, you have some higher frequencies here. And the idea is, you know, you can sort of go back and forth here and. Um, you can invert them and uh, I can, if I wanted to get rid of some uh, annoying noise factor, I can just wipe out one of these frequencies and then I'm still, I'm still left with a much cleaner signal. So I can, I can toggle back and forth. That is the idea. Um, that's a real world application. What actually happens with a Fourier transform is you can give me any arbitrary signal. Um, it could be something like, uh, I don't know, it could be something like this. And this is some uh, wacky audio signal. And I can decompose this. I can decompose this into any number of sines and cosines. So, you know, I can have any number of uh, simple sines and cosines or, or harmonics as we might call them. And uh, I can, uh, depending on the uh, amount of precision or how much, how precisely I'd like to uh, emulate this waveform, I can determine the number of sines and uh, cosines that would have to be added. But I. Um, I present this as sort of the basis of your Fourier transform. We can and we can go backwards um, too. So we can, we can go back to this original signal just by adding together um, all these harmonic components. Uh, if you want a sort of more fun explanation um, on, online, there's a website called Better Explain. They have a pretty cute explanation where it's just you, um, if, if I were to give you a smoothie and let's say the smoothie has some flavor you don't like, 
then there are some tools you can use to extract all the different flavors out, remove the flavor you don't like, and then reassemble the smoothie. That's another way of thinking about it. Um, so anyway, we just go back and forth between having these very simple sinusoids to work with. Um, oh, wow, that's not even a, excuse me, uh, sines do not look like cosines. Um, you know, you can have your sines and cosines and you can sum them up and you will get your um, original waveform. And this is uh, used, uh, you know, all the time in, in signal processing. But there is one problem with the Fourier transform. And like anything that has to do with uh, mathematics, the real world is not as nice. And it turns out that in order to um, you know, do this Fourier transform, you need the actual function which produces this signal. Um, so you know, I mean, in, in this example, th there might be some arbitrary um, f of t that I can give you, and then you can perform um, the integration that you, would, uh, that you would like. And I think I should go ahead and give you guys just uh, kind of what the actual thing looks like here. Uh, and uh, it's actually worth taking a look at how exactly this thing is structured um, because this does carry over um, into the quantum realm. Uh, as, as much as many um, existing works seem to uh, gloss over um, much of the mathematical basis that you need uh, for quantum computing, um, it's, it's, it's inescapable. It's inescapable regardless of how cute um, or, or nice some of these resources may be. They are only cheating you in the long run. Um, so then you would have a of n cosine two pi um, n of x over p. And then you would have the sine version of this. And there would be another coefficient here, b of n um, times the sine. And it would have the same little argument that would go in here. So this is, um, this is sort of what I mean by the Fourier series. You can see the summation here. So it is a series. You do have your cosines and sines, but it is, it is worth you know, taking a look at what exactly is going on here. So the key thing to remember here is you have a sub n and, and b sub n. And these are kind of telling you the amount of each ingredient or, or how much each harmonic of the cosine should be factored in. So uh, per, uh, I mentioned like if I, if I were to go back all the way um, to the earlier example that I had here, um, it sort of tells you like, okay, well, we need a lot of this 60 hertz, but we don't need um, as much of this lower frequency. We need a lot more of say this 50 hertz frequency at this harmonic. Um, or, and we don't need as much of the other. And the way you normally find a sub n and b sub n, your coefficients that dictate um, how, how much cosine or sine you need um, is through a number of two integrals. You, you actually have uh, two integrals to work with here. Uh, I'm just gonna write a sub n just for brevity because I don't want to spend, like turn this entire presentation into a review uh, of um, uh, undergraduate mathematics here. But, uh, a sub n, uh, and then you would have this kind of constant factor here, and you have your integral. Um, S of x is the function we're interested in. S of x is, uh, you know, my voice or the um, continuous function that I have provided to you. And then you would have cosine here. And then you would have 2 pi, uh, let me move this mouse over here, 2 pi xp over, um, let's see if I remember this correctly. Oh, no, sorry, I got the order wrong here. It should be n. 2 pi x n over p. And that should, be, oh, and then of course, don't forget, don't forget your dx there. So this is what's going to give you that a sub n coefficient. And what's, and what's really going on um, is if we look here, you, you take your original function and you multiply it um, by this cosine function. And b sub n is literally uh, the identical formula here, except you're applying it um, with the sine. Uh, if you've ever taken an electrical engineering course, you might be familiar with the idea um, of convolution. But uh, what's really happening here is when you apply this integral, and this p is the period um, of the waveform, when you apply this integral, you're actually saying, okay, how much, how much of the cosine kind of overlaps or, or represents the s of x that's going on here? And that'll give you um, a number of coefficients. It's a, it's a sub n. So um, as I mentioned earlier, you can do as many n's as you want to get a, a degree of accuracy um, to your liking. And that is, in essence, how you decompose any arbitrary function um, into its constituent sines and cosines. So that's, that's the traditional Fourier transform in all of its sort of mathematical glory. Um, it's uh, very nice to play around with when you have the full function. You have everything you need to know about the function. Of course, that's not always the truth. But before I go on, um, are there any questions so far? Am I, am I going a little too fast? Um, would people prefer I, I slow down? Um, I'm more than willing. I'm still monitoring chat. 
So um, if I hear silence for the next 60 seconds, I'm going to assume that I'm either doing everything really well or I'm doing so badly that I have deterred the rest of the audience. <laughs> Flip of the coin, but um, you know that's true for anyone who works in quantum computing. You're always in a superposition of one to the other. All right, okay, looks like things are going well. So now that I've, I've kind of glossed over this Fourier transform, and the reason I glossed over it is because we really care more about, it's uh, more useful, I'm willing to John, argue. I'm going yes. to interrupt, you have something in the chat. Let's see, is it correct to say that the Fourier transform an integral as opposed to a differential operator? Um, say the Fourier transform is an integral. Well, it, it, it's composed of multiple integrals. Uh, and then you have the series. I'm not sure where you're getting the uh, differential operator from. Maybe there's some part of it that I, I don't understand too well. Um, but, uh, I, but you are right. Like, yes, we, we do do this integration to kind of help um, sift through the uh, sort of different harmonics is what we would call them. Um, each nth cosine or nth sine would be considered um, a harmonic. I, I hope that kind of answers the question here. I, I might be misinterpreting um, your question, in which case feel free to um, reiterate and I will um, try and, and see if I can uh, give a more clear explanation. All right. That being said, I think we'll take the next step and talk about the discrete Fourier um, transform. Actually, okay, hold on. I, I'm getting I'm getting ahead of myself. So if you notice, I've been I've been playing very nice with you all. Um, I'm sure there are many of you who know math much better than I do, and you will complain here and say, "Wait a minute, um, it's it's pretty wasteful that I have a cosine and sine, and there are two integrals." There's a nice little um, cheat or hack that mathematicians use, where if you're dealing with sinusoids, we uh, recall that there is this identity um, found none other, none other by um, Leonard Euler, or Euler, I mean, depending on um, which camp you're from. Uh, so it's, it's this property here. I can take the sum of the cosine and sine, and I can represent it as, as sort of this exponential here. And as a result, I don't have to calculate um, two different um, integrals, I only have to do uh, one integral. And that integral would look something like this. So CN is equal to one over P. Um, you might come across literature that uses T instead of P. If they use T, um, it's uh, more common in engineering. Um, P is more common in, in uh, pure mathematics here. Um, zero over P. Oh, oops, there we go. And then you would have your function of interest, uh, F of T, and then from here, you would have e to the negative i 2 pi. Uh, this this, this uh, exponential does look intimidating at first, but um, I assure you, with, um, if, if you mess around with this a lot, uh, it, will, it won't be as intimidating. So this is um, how you would get the uh, coefficients if you were to use this um, property here, um, Euler's identity. So you only have to calculate one set of coefficients. And then from there, um, you get the CN, and you would, this would also go into another um, summation with another uh, similar kind of uh, exponential to represent your frequencies. And, and this is what you will see in quantum computing. Um, you will rarely, if ever, have to deal with a, a raw cosine or sine. Everything gets translated into this um, complex realm. Just because it's a lot easier to work with. And um, the, the sort of basis for quantum mechanics um, is usually all with um, Euler's identity. It just makes the math uh, significantly uh, nicer. So if you have not touched your complex numbers in a while, I strongly encourage you uh, to review them. But this, in essence, is uh, the Fourier transform. And that leads me into a, a bit of a stickler um, that I mentioned earlier. Uh, in order for that all that above math to really play out nicely, you need to have this function here. So if I gave you something like, OK, uh, find the Fourier transform of uh, the, I don't know, sine of 2x. Uh, I don't know, over four or something. You know, it's just some arbitrary. You have all the information you need. This is a continuous function um, and it's, uh, it's all uh, set in stone for you. But in reality, you will not find f of x um, in nature. No one's just going to tell you that, oh, you know, John's voice follows a function uh, of the, I, I don't know, the hyperbola of you know, some other. You will not get that function um, arbitrarily. But what you do have um, is something called sampling. So this is where we get to the discrete um, Fourier transform. And the hint here is the, the word discrete um, just means it's non-continuous. Um, I know it's a very circuitous definition, but um, if you allow me to doodle a little more, that might clear things up. So if I have um, my wave function here, and you can see it's an absolute mess, um, and I, I don't know the function 
that generated this wave function. I have no clue um, what uh, series or, or what uh, mystical functions may have generated this. Uh, but instead, I take, I take individual points in time, or I sample, I sample the function. So I just, you know, I just keep drawing these dots here and I can get the amplitudes. I can get the amplitudes here. And using this information, so keep in mind, we're still in, in the time domain. Um, with this information, I can still go ahead and perform a um, Fourier transform. Although this time um, it is uh, discrete. And as a result, we're not going to be using continuous functions anymore. We deal more with vectors that represent our data. So um, usually the way we would write out this whole thing here is y sub k, uh, one over the square root of n. Um, n is sort of the number of things in your data vector. So the number of samples that I have um, on hand. And then you would still have this uh, summation going on. And we got to be careful here. Um, we have two indices we have to worry about because there are two different um, vectors that we're um, playing with here. Then you would have um, x sub j. And, and notice that um, from now on, I'm going to represent all our sines and cosines in terms of that Eulerian identity. Um, I'm no longer going to write out the uh, entire sine and cosine just for the sake of brevity. And for the fact that I, I do not think there is any quantum computing text in existence that um, will bother with writing out um, the whole thing. So we still have this um, 2 pi i here, up here, and we have jk uh, over n, over n. So, so you know, before I get ahead of myself. Let's kind of explain what's going on here. This vaguely looks like the sort of summation that I had a lot earlier, um, vaguely. Um, you, you'll notice that uh, I think it was, well, I only, I only showed you guys the integral here. Um, but the difference being is that we're no longer plugging in a continuous function anymore. x sub j are the vector of data points that I just got from this kind of chaotic signal here. That's x sub j. Um, it's this nice vector. And then y sub k will be the sort of Fourier transform uh, of x sub j. And I should mention that the elements inside y sub k and um, x sub j are uh, complex valued, they, or they can be complex valued, um, which is particularly useful uh, in, in, or it's it particularly necessary, I should say, not just useful, but necessary, considering that um, quantum computing uh, <laughs> does uh, reside, uh, you know, it, it uses all these complex numbers. So that's just that's the only difference between the Fourier uh, Fourier transform and the uh, discrete Fourier transform. Now um, we no longer have knowledge of the function itself. We just oh, well, excuse me, um, we just have all these different um, data points that are collected um, from the function. So that, in essence, is the um, Fourier. Oh, and I should I should mention here. Uh, so it'd probably be nice to see things here. So if this is um, if this is my vector y, um, this would be indexed using, uh, let's see here, I sub k. Okay, yeah, uh, k and j would be their own um, independent indices here. So k sub j would be equal to zero all the way to n minus one, where n is the uh, number of elements inside um, your vectors for y and x. And the number of elements should be the same. Uh, there's no, there, there should be no instance where you put in your data and you find you, a point goes missing. Um, that does not happen. So this is, this is sort of the orthodox way of showing it. Now, I'm going to take things one step further. This is something that uh, I think is, is crucial that a lot of quantum computing textbooks in, uh, just leave out. And I think, it's, um, I think it's a great shame they do this to uh, many beginners. And it is something called the Vandermond, the Vandermond matrix. Uh, Vandermond matrix. Uh, usually they, they leave it out because um, uh, they don't want to take up your time um, too much with the classical analog. But this, this Vandermond matrix will give you a huge uh, or um, I think it's an excellent aid in figuring out why it is that um, you can take this thing, which looks nothing like a matrix, and you can get a unitary matrix that represents some logic gate from it. So this, this Vandermond matrix. Um, and the idea here is I, um, we're dealing with vectors. So I'm going to go one step further and argue that this sort of all this gunk here, um, I'm using this all this gunk, this summation, and and you know even even this guy here, um, can be crammed um, into a matrix. Now, why in the world would I want to take this and put it into a matrix? Well, it turns out that if you try and you know uh, computationally, if you were to try and do this for each element one by one, it's pretty wasteful. 
you probably have a number of for loops um, and it becomes computationally uh, intensive. Whereas with the matrix, you know, you can do uh, matrix multiplication and we do have, um, you know, uh, current graphics processing units and uh, a myriad of supercomputers and, and sort of parallelized, inherently parallelized CPUs. Even the ones that you are watching um, this Zoom video from or the computer on um, have a much, it's a lot easier to work with, um, work with matrices. So I'm going to go ahead and rewrite that sort of y sub k and, and all of it. And I'm just going to write it like this. x is equal to w times um, little x. So W is the uh, Vandermond matrix. Uh, X is still the data we're interested in. So I should mention this is X sub J. And then the capital X is the equivalent uh, of Y sub K, Y sub K. So what this Vandermond matrix looks like, um, it's going to look something like this. W is equal to, so we still have one over the square root of N. So it's still some familiar territory there. And then our matrix is going to be an N by N matrix n by n. So once again, just uh, repeating, n is the number of elements or sort of number of data points that you were able to get um, from your series here. And now we're going to, um, you know, we're going to play a little game of Etch-a-Sketch. And I'm just going to fill the first column and the first row with ones. But there is a pattern to it. And there's, there's this guy called Omega. And then you would see this is, don't worry if you don't know what Omega is. Um, I'm just drawing out the matrix first. And then I'll explain what uh, what omega is. And there's a nice little um, pattern that goes on here. And this goes to omega to n minus one. And this would go to omega. So you can see that the pattern on the row and column here are identical. Um, and the furthest corner, it'd be n minus one times n minus one, n minus one times n. And then this would be um, omega squared times n minus one. And this would be omega cubed times n minus one. Um, and this would be depending on the size of n, how many data points you have. Now, I should probably explain um, what the heck uh, omega is. Omega is, let's see if I have, okay, cool. I have it here. Um, I've noted this for myself. So omega uh, j sub k, so this is just the uh, sort of matrix uh, index operation we're going through with here, is actually equal to e to the negative 2 pi i over, um, over n. So this, uh, so now th this guy should look very familiar to you. Um, this is from, uh, in fact, it, it's from this guy uh, right here. Although the uh, J and K have been moved over um, as matrix indices, um, you still have your two pi i uh, component there. So that's what uh, omega sub uh, J K, I guess you'd call it, or, or you know, uh, omega with these two uh, indices would be. So this is how you would build your um, Vandermond uh, matrix. And you notice that in the, um, in the exponential here, this n should be your number of elements. And if I were to, um, you know, you can do a sanity check here. I strongly encourage you uh, do this as well. Um, if, if this operation can even work. So if you had um, your matrix here and you got to remember that the number of rows is equal to the number of columns to um, perform any sort of valid multiplication here. And you will get uh, yet another um, equally dimensioned vector here. So things seem to check out here. So this is, this is the discrete Fourier transform. And this is, this is, um, essentially the classical part um, of the quantum Fourier transform. The quantum Fourier transform is an implementation of the discrete Fourier transform. So um, I, you know, uh, I, I took this detour to introduce the Vandermond matrix because you will see it again um, in every um, quantum computing text. Even if they don't tell you it's called a Vandermond matrix, that's exactly what it is. Uh, now at this point, uh, I'd like to transition over because I, I said that the quantum Fourier transform is an amalgamation. Um, it's a, it's a sort of this very elegant combination between two different things. Uh, so there, here's the classical part, the Fourier transform, the discrete Fourier transform, this matrix. And now um, there is a quantum component that I think um, you all need to uh, sort of uh, take a look at. And uh, before I go any further, are there any questions? Am I still going too fast? Or um, is there any detail I might have breezed over that you want to sort of go in depth um, a little more? And I understand if you don't believe me that this, this thing is the equivalent um, of the uh, traditional uh, writing of the discrete Fourier transform. I, I completely understand. In fact, I didn't believe it when I saw it. I thought, you know, I, I thought this was um, uh, too elegant. It was, it was too nice. And you always should I, be suspicious. I have a question. Yes, go um, ahead. Why, why are the elements of the matrix um, with like what powers? Um, oh, what? okay. Yeah. Uh, that's 
so if, if we look at, um, so if I look at how I define omega here, um, omega sub uh, j of k is equal to e to the negative, um, you know, this, this exponential here, the exponents are sort of a, a leftover of this, oh, not the i, excuse me, the, um, hold on, I'm it here, the uh, j and k that were kind of sitting here. Uh, these now, right now, they're being used both to index as well as this um, square here. And, and this is just more of a, um, uh, how would I put the nth root of unity? Uh, I'm trying to think of a nice way to explain why the exponents are there. I'm almost willing to argue it's um, for the intents uh, of expressing the different possible harmonics that you can run into. Oh, I see. Yeah. I, th I think that makes a little more sense. I, I know it's a bit of a messy explanation. Yeah. I, I do apologize, but, but you make an excellent point. You know, why does Omega have um, these exponents here? Um, it's, almost, uh, it, it's almost similar to what we were seeing earlier with the traditional, like the, uh, the original Fourier transform, where if you were to look at these cosines and sines here, you notice there's like an N that gets plugged in to represent the particular um, harmonics you're interested in. Although this, this particular format here, um, this matrix is, you know, it, go, it undergoes uh, matrix multiplication as well. So there will be some dot product and, and you'll see terms kind of come together and uh, coalesce. So. Thank uh, you. Yeah, no problem. Um, excellent question though. Uh, I'm sorry I couldn't provide a, a better um, or a more elegant explanation. Uh, are there any other uh, questions before I move on to sort of the uh, quantum aspect? Okay, cool. Thank you everyone. Everyone's happy so far. Number of participants are still the same. That's good. Sometimes, you know, if someone drops out of a meeting, that's how I know, like, holy smokes. Now I'm really, uh, I've really shot myself in the foot here, but I digress. Uh, now I, I, I'm going to go into sort of the, um, the quantum realm here. And we're going to sort of remember our good friend, um, Qubit. So, yeah, so this is where uh, I wanted to kind of remind what exactly this whole thing with phase is. I think phase is, for, for beginners, it's one of the most confusing things that gets thrown around. Like, oh, it's, a, oh, it's this phase. Because everyone can understand that, okay, if, if I have a, a zero and a one, like the uh, zeros and ones that our computers use, uh, and I get a superposition so I can, I can mix them, cool. So I have, I don't know, one half of, of zero and uh, one half of uh, one. Although, although many of you will find out this is not a valid um, expression here. You should definitely put the square root here to make sure um, things are normalized properly. Um, people can understand this very easily. But the moment you mention, oh, there's also this other thing called phase, which helps you encode a lot more information, um, you know, you get a bunch of blank stares. So I, I really wanted to um, kind of peel that apart uh, very quickly. So uh, we'll just establish some ground rules here. I assume everyone has seen the um, dirac Braquette uh, notation. Um, if not, uh, this is just a, a vector. And we know that um, given any two orthogonal vectors, so they're, uh, you know, in the two dimensional plane, we can say perpendicular, but once you start going into 3D or 4D, we drop the word perpendicular for orthogonal. Um, that's where we start to get um, a number of, uh, we, we can make any other vector um, we so desire. So basically we can use this two entry vector to represent the qubit state. And there are two coefficients, complex value coefficients that will determine what our qubit state is. We have alpha and beta. And alpha and beta, um, this is part of the fact that your vector lives in a, a Hilbert space um, or a quantum Hilbert space. Uh, one of the properties of that vector space is this, this has to be true. Your coefficients should, you know, if I take the absolute value or the magnitude and square them um, and add them together, it should equal one. You should never have any instance where um, doing this operation gives you anything greater than one. Otherwise it's an in, uh, invalid quantum state. Uh, now alpha and beta are, are both complex valued. So, uh, you know, they're both uh, in the sort of realm of, of complex numbers here. And I would normally, you know, if I was being naive, um, I would express this as you know, alpha is equal to a plus bi and then beta was equal to, um, you know, here. Uh, C plus D I. And, and this is, um, this is a, a fair thing to write out. But as I mentioned earlier, uh, mathematicians uh, want to save time. Uh, we do not want to bother with individual sines and cosines. So we go ahead and whip out um, Euler's identity yet again. And you can recall that, uh, you know, we can just do this something uh, along the lines of this. And uh, I guess it's like, it'd be kind of nice to see this. Uh, if you have a complex value, so this could be your X coordinate and Y coordinate, but instead with Euler's identity, I only need um, the magnitude here and then you would have your um, phase. This is where the phase comes from. 
um, then you would have your uh, theta here. And because of this normalization that goes on, um, the fact that we would like to not manipulate the uh, magnitude of the vector or the length, we don't really have to worry about r so much as um, theta. So the theta is kind of the um, killer thing here. And there are two types of phase that you see that get thrown around um, in quantum computing. There's global phase uh, and there is relative phase. So what exactly are the uh, differences here? So phase is just this, uh, you know, uh, a byproduct um, of using Euler's identity uh, to sort of go back and forth on these complex numbers. Um, what exactly is the difference between relative phase and uh, global phase? And the idea comes from this. So if I mentioned if alpha and beta are both sort of complex numbers, then I could also, uh, here, let me go ahead and rewrite this. It's a lot nicer to um, see again here. Alpha is one, then we have this here, and then this would be our um, ket psi, which is nice. So phase is that kind of dangling theta um, from the um, Eulerian identity. A global phase is what happens when I try to change, if I try to change the phase um, of this entire quantum system. And the way I would do that is, okay, I, I will just multiply um, this uh, ket psi, this quantum state with a, a and so that means that this, um, this phase would get multiplied um, to each one of these coefficients here. Global phase, doesn't do anything. It literally does not uh, change the outcome uh, that you would get um, from, from uh, if you did not apply uh, the global phase. Um, it's, uh, and the reason why uh, you will hear the term every now and then, oh, global phase doesn't matter, is because it, it starts to make sense why the block sphere, that really cool um, visual representation of a qubit state, uh, uh, why exactly it's um, the way it is. And, and I, I'll get there um, soon enough. So if, if I were to um, apply this, so, you know, and then I would do something, uh, you know, with this added phase factor here, um, this is actually equivalent to this. You, you, and by adding this global phase, nothing actually changes if I were to measure the um, probabilities that are uh, going on here. So that's, that's global phase. But relative phase is, you know, if I were to look at sort of alpha and, and beta here, um, those would be considered your um, relative phases, sort of like the each component that is dangling in front of, or each sort of subphase you could even think of that is in front of each ket here. So that would be almost like, uh, um, you know, many of you have seen this notation before, um, ket plus and sort of ket minus, which are representative of the two sort of Hadamard states, or um, if you're along the Z basis, you would see something um, like this, where this would be um, one, or no, this is zero, one over the square root of two. And then you would, oh, wow, holy, sm that's a terrible two. Um, square root of two versus um, the same thing, but you wouldn't have the plus in the middle, you'd have, um, you'd have a minus. So those would be like your relative phases if I were to uh, compare the two. Uh, and the, the idea, like the reason why it's nice to know that global phase doesn't matter is, uh, okay, now this is, this might really push the amount of math you know. Uh, well, I, I, that, then again, I might, that, that might just be my, um, that might just be me uh, assuming, uh, <laughs> something that isn't there. Uh, but the, the block sphere only needs kind of, you know, two pieces of data. But how is it that I can represent all these quantum states um, on a sphere like this, but I only need two pieces of data, even though there are two complex numbers. And if, if I look at the complex numbers, the reason why I wrote them out, A plus BI and then C plus DI, is they're actually, you know, you look at this and you're like, wait a minute, there are um, four. There are four pieces of data. So how do you go from, you know, four pieces of data um, onto this sphere. And furthermore, um, how did the sphere only need two pieces of data to um, plot a, your state vector or a, a, some quantum state of interest? And this is where that um, phase, uh, things get interesting. Uh, uh, so you can, you can feel free to ignore what's gonna come out of my mouth for this part. Um, basically, if I have a sphere um, and I wanted to represent any point uh, on the surface and inside the sphere, um, it would take three values. And topologically, um, so this is, this is some topography here, you can do this mapping. Um, this is known as a, a Hopf coordinate, where I can, I can take um, any two complex numbers, and this can represent um, some point um, along the surface um, of this sphere. A as a result, um, or not just the surface, uh, but even inside the sphere. But so as a result, um, we get this alpha is actually equal to this guy, E i psi, um, hold on, let's see, of cosine theta 2. And then beta is equal to E 
i, and then, okay, this is where things get a little interesting. Um, now you have psi plus phi or phi, uh, depending on uh, which math professors you may have experienced. Um, and then you have the sine of theta over two. So this is essentially how we can translate um, between say our complex numbers to three coordinates. But remember, there's this property that I mentioned, um, the normalization property, alpha squared and, and beta squared equal one. And I also mentioned, um, like I, I said, oh, the global phase does not matter. So I want you to take a look again and you'll notice there's this e to the i psi and then you have an e to the i psi here as well. And if I were to, you know, once again, uh, draw things out again. So, you know, you have ket psi is equal to um, alpha ket zero plus beta ket one. Uh, and, and I would just plug these things in. Uh, you would notice that there is an e i psi in front of this alpha. And then the same thing happens to the beta. So you can automatically, you automatically know that this is a global phase. It's just kind of dangling in front. And we can, we can you know, throw this guy out. We can chuck it out. It, it, it literally contributes uh, nothing. Uh, and this makes sense because um, for the quantum states we're interested in, in our state vector, uh, we only care about the surface of the sphere. We don't actually care about any of the internal points. Um, although uh, maybe in uh, more advanced workshops, I might talk about thermal noise and, and mixed states, in which case you, you aren't exactly guaranteed um, such a nice vector. But as a result, um, that means we only need two pieces of information now um, to plot on the sphere. We only need this theta here. Um, we'll need this and this, um, this phi or this phi that's uh, kind of sitting here. So phi, uh, a theta and phi. And if you, uh, for those of you that are a lot more visual um, towards this stuff, I know I, for one, am, am a very visual person, um, despite the uh, terrible handwriting and, and diagrams I've been giving you for the past 45 minutes, um, your phi would represent kind of the rotation. And then you would have um, theta, which would represent kind of okay, how high up or how high down would you go? Uh, but I, the, the reason why I went through all that detail is just to get you guys to understand what exactly um, is phase. Um, and, and phase becomes a, a huge part as to why we even want to, um, you know, why do we even bother with the quantum Fourier transform uh, and its myriad of, of properties? So considering that um, the quantum Fourier transform if I go all the way back up here, um, is a change of base. It, it's, it's a change of basis. So there might be some data that's encoded as some kind of rotation or some kind of phase on that sphere that uh, in a normal uh, computational basis, I can't see. Uh, just to give you guys like a, a quick idea of what I'm complaining about here or, or griping about is that um, if the vector is kind of just sitting uh, on the circumference here, and then I go ahead and do a measurement, well, you know, that, that's 50 50. It's, it's the same thing. Like, it's 50, there's a 50% chance it's a zero, 50% uh, chance it's a one. But let's say the vector is um, sitting over here now. I've, I've decided to rotate it. I, I maybe I've changed the phase or phi um, in those Hopf coordinates that I mentioned earlier, or I should say diminished Hopf coordinates because we're not dealing with the entire sphere anymore. Uh, and I do the measurement again. Well, I still have 50% um, zero and 50% one. I've lost data. So by doing this change of basis, uh, I can work a little, I, there's a little more elbow room um, for calculations and, and I can get more data um, from the sort of block sphere here or, or perform more useful um, manipulations. So now you guys know um, the difference between relative and global phase, or you may have already known it and I have just re-explained it. Um, in which case, uh, at least you learned some uh, topology because I know for a fact that this is not the orthodox way of, of teaching uh, people why the block sphere is the way it is. But uh, uh, considering that I, I've looked into sort of topological quantum computing, um, the topic of topology and groups, uh, group theory is inevitable. So this was kind of a, a nice analog. So we have, uh, I'd say like that last five to 10 minutes um, because Samarth has something that um, he'd like to present to you all before we, uh, you know, all of you go and uh, let this kind of uh, mellow in your, um, sit in your brains. But are there any more uh, questions or, uh, you know, objections to, to what I've said so far? Um, or I can, uh, I'm more than willing to uh, pause and, and sort of uh, explain myself. Um, and once again, you don't have to know, like it, it's not a deal breaker if um, you don't know that hop coordinate thing, but I thought it was pretty cool. I thought it was like, oh, that's a, a very elegant geometrical explanation for uh, what see, I can has mapping to block hyperbola. <laughs> Kirk is uh, having a fun time with that little um, explanation there. Uh, <laughs> but I'm assuming everyone's happy. So now uh, I can, I'm, I'm going to put them together. So I, I want to explain, okay, now we have this quantum understanding of all these phases and, and you know, why exactly this, uh, 
phase basis is not an actual term that gets thrown around, but that's how my brain thinks of it if we do this um, for quantum Fourier transform. And we also know the classical analog to the quantum Fourier transform, which is the uh, discrete Fourier transform. So let's sort of go back to the vector that I, I keep rewriting over and over. Um, and it's ket psi. And ket psi represents a qubit or could represent any number of qubits. And I want to point out that there is this uh, mathematical relation here. Um, I'm, just, I'm just rewriting what ket psi is here. So you have you know, j equals zero, and then um, any sort of n minus one. And then you have any number of coefficients. And then you'd have uh, your basis vector um, here. Um, and your basis vector, of course, is indexed um, by that summation operator. So then you'd get a vector that looks something like this, a sub n, and then dot, 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 dot. And then you go to a sub n minus one. So this is just another way uh, of expressing um, psi. Uh, it, it's a little more convoluted, but there is a reason why I'm doing this. I, I've kind of, I've blown this up uh, because now that you know what the discrete Fourier transform is and, and that Vandermond matrix that I've been um, throwing around, if I want to apply um, the uh, Fourier transform uh, to this ket, um, it, it's going to end up looking like this here. So then it would just be the summation, um, but then we go to k now, k sub zero of n minus one, and then you would have b sub k ket k. And uh, b sub k here is once again, the uh, it's just like it's yet another summation here. So if I were to write out the whole thing, it looks like um, two different summations. Uh, and, and for some of you guys that are more familiar with like the Einstein matrix notation, then you would see like, oh, you know, that's where my little, uh, where, that's where the little matrix comes from. But uh, I've opted not to do that because I, I think it's a bit of an eyesore. So this would still be one over the square root of n, and you would still have um, once again the components that we had um, last time. So you would still have your um, nth roots of unity. Uh, sitting here, and then you would still have n for the number of elements. Now, for the, uh, you know, I've, I've been writing all these symbols, and, and yes, I understand it is, um, it is a royal pain in the butt. Uh, but what I would like to do is let's do one example. Let's, let's do an example here. That might be something that is uh, far more useful. I have five minutes to do this. So let's see how quickly um, my brain can uh, pull this off. I only want to do a, a one qubit transformation. And some of you guys might already know, like a bunch of uh, textbooks say, okay, well, a one qubit quantum Fourier transform is the Hadamard, but why is it the Hadamard? You know, where does that derivation come from? Uh, where does that derivation come from? So I'm, I'm going to do exactly that. Um, and I'm going to do, uh, I'm just gonna do it for one qubit. So the, we're gonna do the quantum Fourier transform for one single qubit. So psi is equal to nothing more than, um, you know, you, you'd normally say a sub zero um, of ket zero plus, uh, a sub one of ket one. So uh, if, if I were to actually write the state vector out here, it would look more like this. Um, you would have, um, you know, you'd have your entry here for alpha and your entry here for beta. Um, considering we're doing the discrete Fourier transform, let's, uh, we, we have two elements we're working with here. So we know that n has to equal two. So as a result, we are working with a um, two by two matrix. Um, the Vandermond matrix has one over the square root of n. So this is one over the square root of two. Now, um, there are all those kind of omegas that are floating around. Uh, and I remind you that omega is kind of the uh, harmonic, or it's sort of the basis of all the harmonics that we're going to be messing around with. So 2 pi i j k uh, over n. So in this case, um, n equals 2, n equals 2. And uh, we're going to start indexing. So uh, our matrices are uh, zero indexed, uh, unlike if you were to use R, which uh, does one indexing. And um, that's like a whole nother argument in the software engineering community. Uh, but if we were to plug in um, this omega, so this is, uh, the coordinates here are zero, zero. So that means that I has to be zero and J has to be zero. So if we just look at this exponent just in our head, like the I and J um, are both set to zero. So the numerator zero over N, well then, well, you have just E to the zero, which is just one. In fact, this coordinate, this position here and this position here have a, a zero in them. So as a result, you will get zero in the exponential here. And this becomes one and one. So now we have our ones here. But what about this guy? Uh, this guy uh, is actually at one, one. So for coordinates at one, one, that means, you know, I is equal to one and uh, J is equal to one. And this would represent is equal to E to the negative two pi over, and then n is two, right? Oh, sorry, there's an i here, and then n is two. So 
I could, you know, if I was being very lazy and I was on a test, I could just say, okay, this is equal to e to the negative pi i. Uh, but uh, remember uh, Euler's identity and, of course, the uh, sort of uh, roots of unity or de Boivre's principle, where I can, uh, given some imaginary number or given n number of roots of unity, um, I can plug in some imaginary number and take its exponent over and over, and it should equal um, some positive integer. Uh, if this is even, if n is even, then it can only equal one. Or, uh, but if n is odd, then you might get something like um, one and negative one. But the easier route um, that I like to do, um, just a you know, a nice little walk along the countryside here, is you remember Euler's identity that I, I brought up. So, cosine of negative pi plus i times the sine of negative pi. I times the sine of negative pi. And we know that this goes to zero. So there's no imaginary component, but we do know that this uh, is non-zero. This goes to one, or uh, I should say negative one. Wow, I'm getting, uh, getting a little sloppy there. So this becomes a negative one. So we've just performed, uh, or I've, I've come up with the matrix um, for the uh, transform uh, from uh, a quantum Fourier transform of one qubit. Now, if any of you guys have ever you know, uh, built a lot of circuits, this should look very, very familiar. In fact, this is the beloved Hadamard gate. It is the single qubit Hadamard gate. And this is like what I was trying to get towards br bridging both the sort of quantum and um, the classical aspects. And Samarth here is, um, he's got the little confetti flyers. Uh, so th this is um, sort of why it is that all these textbooks say, ah, yes, you know, the uh, Hadamard is a, a single qubit quantum Fourier transform because it bugged me to no end that they never explained that. And, and I figured um, it would be a, a very elegant uh, example here. Uh, that being said, uh, I'm going to go ahead and end um, the workshop for today. And you'll notice that I said, you know, we're not, uh, we won't say any circuits or uh, multi-qubit examples, but that will be um, in our next workshop. Uh, I will most likely have a, a written addition to this because our organization does have a, a textbook, um, which I have authored. So uh, with that being said, I, I want to, switch hands over to um, Samarth here because Samarth does have a, a presentation or just a, a quick slide um, to show you guys. Yeah, certainly. Thanks, John, for a great presentation. And uh, yeah, if you can let me screen share, then I'll- uh, Oh, shoot. Okay, hold on. I'll uh, go over that. We can uh, go into any questions after that. Advanced sharing options, um, all participants. There we go. All right, okay. I, think, uh, I think I should do it. For sure, for sure. All right. Well, I just wanted to like quickly say that we're very excited that that uh, all of you are here, and uh, I wanted to kind of go over like a couple of things we're coming up, and also like um, the certification program we're trying to start. Um, we're just trying to make it so that you know there's there's more incentive to continue attending, and also that you know there's something that you can show off in terms of uh, applying for internships or or you know, trying to show that you have some competency in, in quantum. Um, so uh, yeah, basically if to be a certified member of this club, um, you have to attend eight meetings or you have to have completed four and also done a final project. Um, ideally, we want you all to be here this whole, uh, whatever workshops we run and, and to, to build projects, but we know that's, that's not always possible. Um, and, uh, yeah, you know, if you're unable to attend the meeting, but you still want to get credit for that toward certification, we, we will have an absence form on our website very soon. Um, and yeah, as long as you're an attendee already, you, we, we consider you a member. Um, uh, and then only once you like, only if you want to, you know, continue showing up and, and build, build actual projects to be say that it would be like a certification and, uh, um, yeah. So uh, in terms of other kind of uh, projects and whatnot that we have coming up too, I just wanted to kind of uh, talk about, we have, uh, we're, we're trying to work on a collaborative project um, with Blue Quantum, which is a local Sacramento quantum computing startup, uh, IBM and the Quantum Computing Collaborative on uh, a protein folding project to see if we can um, uh, work together on uh, a model for for protein folding on a quantum computing device. Um, so the, the problem of protein folding is essentially, um, we, we know the, we can figure out what the, the uh, genomic sequence is, but it's very hard to determine the actual structure um, of a protein. 
so being able to model that computationally is, is, would be really amazing. And there was a team at, at DeepMind AlphaFold that did this recently um, to a high degree. Um, however, they, you know, there are some problems in terms of like um, how that can adapt to different solvents and then also the amount of time it takes and the amount of data you need um, to use a machine learning based model. So we really feel that quantum could, could potentially have uh, some solutions, especially as the teams at IBM and Protein Cure have already been kind of uh, working towards this over the last few years. Um, so we have kind of, um, kind of two areas that we're looking at. One with more with IBM, uh, which is around grow research um, to essentially look for uh, areas of zero or lower energy and then continue to fold in uh, to those areas. Uh, and then, uh, which is based on more of the traditional um, uh, variational quantum algae solvers and quantum chemistry that we're more used to. Um, and then another uh, way we're looking at this is uh, through the help of Blue Quantum, um, where they're looking at, you know, how can we take the knot theory that we're seeing in, in metals and whatnot, where you're looking at it from a completely topographical mathematical standpoint of how to, how to optimize for the best knot and how do we model this on a quantum device. Um, and so they, they want to go the route of just like basically making very large uh, graphs on the D-Wave quantum computing device um, and uh, indicating uh, filled in spots as ones, not filled in spots as zeros, and then uh, collapsing them to different energy states um, to see uh, you know, what knots are, are created. Um, so yeah, like we're, 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 we're also collaborating with the Quantum Computing Collaborative, which is um, you know, a group of students at Harvard, MIT, who are working on uh, quantum computing applications uh, on this. So we're really trying to make this kind of like as open a pro uh, project as possible. Um, uh, and uh, we'll be copy lefted so, you know, it can be uh, used uh, freely. Um, and yeah, we're, we're, we're about to close um, hopefully some actual student positions like paid positions um, for both the, both of these objectives. Um, so yeah, if this is interesting to you, um, definitely get in touch with me. Um, and we'd love to chat about how we can maybe work together on this because uh, it's, it's definitely very exciting stuff. Um, so yeah, at this point, yeah, any questions about anything I said about this project or, or certification? I, all of you guys for attending today, yeah, you, I already like, like basically have your name down as, okay, you attended. So there's no need to like fill anything out. Um, but yeah, in the future, if, if you miss, there's, there will be that absence form. Um, and, uh, yeah, if you have any questions on John's lecture as well, um, please feel free to ask now. Yeah. Uh, you know, once again, uh, you know, usually my lectures are a lot more interactive. It's not just me like doodling on, um, one note and then you see all my uh, terrible uh, mouse scribbles. Um, I usually have like a, a notebook for you guys to play around with or, um, you know, something uh, much more, uh, demonstrative, um, of what's going on. But, uh, yeah, if, I mean, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to ask, uh, I think I should mention, um, seeing as how I, I wasn't able to get to like an actual um, full circuit, like I just went with one qubit. Uh, next workshop, I originally planned on, on going into hardware. Um, I think a lot of, um, a, lot of a lot of quantum techs don't like to uh, sort of touch on that area. They're like, okay, we can live in la la land and pretend we don't have to worry about uh, uh, what exactly the uh, metal is. But uh, I'll probably um, for the next workshop, I will have a um, full blown demo. Um, who was it that was asking me the, um, is he still, he's still here? Uh, uh, Narek, uh, I hope I'm saying your name right. Uh, I, I'll probably, I'll, I'll try and find a better um, answer to uh, the omegas and the exponentials because I, I have a rough idea in my mind, but I, 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 it seems to escape me how to um, put it nicely into words. Uh, and speaking of which, uh, I think Tina already set the links out. Uh, let's see. Okay, yeah, the, um, there, is a, there is a book there. Um, you, can, you can definitely tell like, oh, it's still under construction, but I will have like a, a fully written a document. Um, so you guys, you know, if, if you find these uh, uh, lectures to be um, uh, <laughs> not as nice as I think them to be, um, the, the text is definitely there for you. And um, I'm always open uh, to feedback. And one last thing, uh, the website should be up um, pretty soon. Um, our organization's website. That's something I've been working on um, as well. So uh, 
quantum computing at Davis will officially have its own like little little piece of the internet. <laughs> yeah. Have any of you actually implemented QFT before? I know that Amir, you were working on IBM stuff before and same thing with you on the rug. Um, you guys were kind of telling me about stuff like that. Yeah, um, I not recently, but now I'm wondering if I have done it for one of the uh, previous challenges um, I'd have to dig through my projects to see if I've implemented it or not. Yeah. Nice. Right. So, Marth, I think, um, yeah, I think it's, uh, I don't want to hold everyone here. I've seen how it's uh, 6.05 on Friday night too, so. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank everyone. Thanks everyone for coming and uh, hope you learned something and see you next week. Yeah, um, I'll, I'll have the uh, recordings uploaded uh, very soon. But once again, thank you all for um, your questions and feedback. Yeah, thanks, everyone. Enjoy your uh, weekend. Thanks for coming. Enjoy your weekend. Thanks, guys. I nice see you, Danny. You too. Talk soon. For sure, for sure. I don't know, glad you could join us, man. I know you're like pretty much like it's quite early for you. So very happy to see you here as well. Hope, hope it was uh, informative. <laughs> yeah, it was really very informative. Nice. Yeah. Nice, nice. All right. Well, yeah, I mean, unless anybody has any other questions, I'm going to head off. Um, All right. Fun stuff. All right, see you guys.